Hey, I'm Derek. And I'm Noah. And you're listening to A Bite Of. Where we take our current favorite pop culture obsession and enjoy it one nibble at a time. Seventy three yards apart. That's, that's yeah. I'm gonna get my phone out and measure it. <laughs> that's how we do it. <laughs> We're seventy three yards apart talking about this new Doctor Who episode. And I feel like this is the first episode where I really just need to talk about it. Yeah. And with you, our watchers and listeners, help us understand it. Or maybe that's a point. Don't understand it. But I need to. I think the only way to get through it is by talking about it. <laughs> so I'm glad we're both here today to do it. Before we get into this timey-wimey, horror-infused episode of Doctor Who, make sure you're following us. If you're watching us on YouTube, subscribe, like, give us a comment. Spotify, if you listen to us there, you know you can see our faces Yeah, on Spotify. We're pretty cute. Crazy. Yeah. We're both wearing um, very spring-inspired attire today. Yeah. I wish I could wear Shudy Gatwa's Paddington-inspired. That yellow coat and that orange hat. He, th- This doctor's just knocking it out of the park as far <laughs> as fashion is concerned. The fits. Yeah. Like, I just want just a compilation of all the insane fits for this season because... Holy shit. There must be some, at the end of it, there must be some sort of secret message they're trying to tell us through everything. That the doctor can look good too. (laughs) (laughs) Not so secret after all. (laughs) That's, that's the point of it. Make sure you leave a review. If you haven't left a review, throw some stars our way and let's us know that, Hey, you like what we're doing and we appreciate that. Last but not least, Patreon X-Men 2000 movies, the trilogy. We are talking about it because we are on the road to Deadpool and Wolverine. So yeah i'm so excited (laughs) and then down the line so we're still doing our doctor who episodes right we do have a very special surprise coming i don't want to jinx it so i'm not going to really say too much about it but just 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 be on the lookout for that leave it at that that's it i'm done all right spoiler alert if you do not want to be spoiled in any of the details of 73 yards stop listening Mm -hmm. all right you've been warned so let us officially take a bite of Doctor Who episode four, 73 Yards, written by Russell T. Davies and directed by Dylan Holmes Williams. Landing on a cliff in Wales, the doctor accidentally breaks a fairy circle, causing him to disappear. 73 yards away, a mysterious old woman follows Ruby Sunday wherever she goes. She drives anyone away who tries to talk to her. Ruby is left by those she holds most dear for decades, trying to figure out what it is the peculiar apparition wants. <laughs> that was good. That was tight. I almost didn't get any of those words out. So that was exciting that I made it through. <laughs> Before we get into the general thoughts yeah. of this episode. Actually, that's not what I meant to say. I meant to actually say, let's get into the gen- I am in a tiny wimey loop. I don't know what's happening. You're, you know what? I think that you need to take a breath because this episode has just been driving you mad since last night. It has. Okay. Give me your TARDIS eye view of this episode. We're halfway done with season one. Is that true? Yes. Oh, dear. Yeah. All right. Well, so this is so funny because I feel like when we watch things kind of in this vein, I'm usually the one that's like, I don't understand. This didn't make sense. Blah, 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 blah. It finished last night and I was like, got it i was like that was awesome and you were like but what i was like no i get it it totally made sense i think that uh as you all know i love the twilight zone this was giving me so much twilight zone vibe that i was just completely taken in by it i 100 percent agree it was weird it was like we swapped places because a lot of times i'm like it was ambiguous i love that about it like it's just left up to the person And usually you're the one questioning. So it was a bizarre situation all the way around. And it was a bizarre episode. And I loved it. Oh, I absolutely loved it. Loved everything about it. And I do get that Twilight Zone feel for it. Um, I loved that it was like a mix between two of my favorite episodes of Doctor Who, Turn Left, which both of these episodes, if you haven't watched them before, you can watch them on their own. So there's a Turn Left, which is a Donna Noble centric episode. Mm. And then Midnight, which is a David Tennant with Donna Noble, but it's his episode. It was so good that they made it into a play. Just saying, it's very Mm. good. Um, But it gave me those vibes from it. And I loved it. I enjoyed every minute of it, but I left it being like, what the hell? Yeah. I, wait, are we, do we not know what what, what happened? What is this? And sometimes 
I feel like maybe we'll know by the end of it. Or that's the point. Yeah. Like I, it was just there just to confuse you. One of the things that you've kind of always shared about Doctor Who through the years is that sometimes there are just really tough mm. lives of some of the companions or years for the companions. And so this felt very much like that. There is just a entire life of rubies that's really hard mm -hmm. um and so like that's where i took that but as far as I, I wanted to mention the twilight zone episodes that i really felt this please do so i have three one of them's a little bit of a stretch it's more about how they shot it than anything else but the first one where i really see vibes is the hitchhiker oh. right so there is that young woman nan winters she's driving cross country and she keeps seeing the apparition of a man who's saying going my way right so we, we feel that, right? Especially in the scenes of Ruby on the train where that woman is just always appearing and she's there for a reason. The second one is an episode called Nightmare as a Child. So this is one that isn't like that popular, I feel like, but there is a woman who comes home and there's a little girl playing on her steps of her apartment and she feels some connection to this little girl. Is it her little girl? It turns out it's her oh. as a child because she's warning her of danger, right? So again, we see the same person split in their right. lives. The last one that it reminds me of is the after hours, which is one of my favorite, right? When she comes back and turns out she's a mannequin, right? Yeah. But spoiler alert. But the thing that really kind of reminded me of this in this episode of Doctor Who is the scene in the pub when there are those really tight close up shots of their faces and they're talking, right? And there's that, there's that part when uh, she's back on the 13th floor and it's like, Marsha, Marsha, get off it, dear. And it's just the close ups of their faces. I really felt like there was so much inspiration from Twilight Zone in this episode. And, you know, two of my favorite times of the year are Fourth of July and New Year's because there's Twilight Zone, there's Twilight Zone marathons on. So this one just had me right from the beginning. Yeah, it's a very tried and true tradition in our household, the mm -hmm. ABO household. Um, we actually did some episodes on the Twilight Zone, so you can go back in our catalog and look at that. We kind of grouped some episodes together of like, it was Earth all along and stuff like that. And the Hitchhiker and After Hours mm -hmm. were one of those that we talked about. So if you want to hear our thoughts on those, go back. Go back. Yeah, go in the TARDIS and go back. Years ago, we covered that. Years ago. Wild. That was fun. That was fun. Um, oh, I love all those episodes. I love it when Doctor Who does horror. It doesn't do it too often. It's very rare. But I absolutely love it because, mm -hmm. you know, we get the sci-fi, right? And in this season, it really seems like a lot of the rules from the past Doctor Who seasons are kind of jumbled up, right? Mm -hmm. We got a lot of myths. We got the, the Pantheon. We got the Toymaker. We got the Maestro. And it seems like myths and legends and gods and stuff like that are now here. And I would say that it's probably because of 14's. Um, taking the salt to the edge of the universe and with Donna Noble and all that in the wild blue yonder. And so that probably is going to be something that comes back at the end of the season. But I just wanted to throw that out there because I feel like it's as a longtime Doctor Who fan, it being not so much science-y mm. is my knee-jerk reaction to be like, this is weird. I see. You know what I mean? Yeah. The supernatural more is seems to be taking a foothold in this season. And I'm like, I like it, mm. but like, uh, it's different, right? I have a question for you as a longtime Doctor Who viewer. What is Doctor Who's as a property? What's its thoughts on free will versus destiny? Ugh, it depends. Yeah. On like what doctor, what story, you know, um, I always do feel like the doctor is a champion of free will mm -hmm. but because of paradoxes because of timing wimey stuff because of time itself sometimes there are those fixed points in time where you can't change it so then that's the whole conversation of destiny and fate i think that there are some points where you can't change them and no matter how many times you do try to change it it's always going to happen regardless so it depends mm. but i do feel like the doctor is always a champion for you're misunderstanding this thing. This thing has a mind of its own. I mean, in Space Babies, he tried to save the boogie monster. Come on. Like, they just thought it was a monster. He's like, no, everything deserves to live. Mm -hmm. So I would say that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So getting into really one of our first details of this episode, there is this fairy circle, right? And as they're walking towards this fairy circle, the doctor 
tells her of a future prime minister of the UK that's one of the most horrible things to ever happen to the country. And so he accidentally steps on and breaks a twine in this fairy circle, and then he disappears. Because he was shooting the final season of Sex Education. (laughs) Is that really what it was? (laughs) That is, yeah. No way. Yeah. Um, I like it. I mean, regardless, like, I think it's really fun to have a companion-centric episode. Mm. Um, And also, fun fact, at the time of filming, uh, Millie Gibson is 18, and this is her first shoot for Doctor Who. So her first time filming for Doctor Who, she knocked it out of the park. Oh, absolutely. And that's a really interesting fact, because... If you think about it, so much of the magic between the doctor and his companion is their chemistry. So it's really kind of like it makes sense that they weren't together much in this episode, especially if this is their first time shooting where they didn't need that chemistry on screen that they would need time to build off screen. Yeah. So giving her this moment to just shine as herself and really be Ruby on her own, I think is interesting for the actor as well as the character. And she, I mean, phenomenal performance. I love that in Boom, the last episode, Shooty and Millie, but Shooty, I mean, performance, series defining performance for him. And in this one, I mean, geez, she layers, layers of like acting and emotion and the genre mixes in here and her having to sidestep between both of those is fantastic. Not even layers, but years. <laughs> she she had to play Ruby at 20 something, 30 something, 40 something. Elderly. I mean, that's <laughs> that's range. I, I <laughs> want to I do want to bring up so it does seem like so far in these four episodes there's a theme of the doctor stepping on something. Mm-hmm. Like stepping into something. You know, the first episode Space Babies, Ruby, or I guess it's not just the doctor, but so Ruby stepping on the butterfly and changing the human race, right? The devil's cord. I don't really know if there's a stepping thing that happens in there, only that they were stepping on the road, the, the zebra keys, essentially. Mm-hmm. And in the last one, stepped on the mine. And in this one, he stepped on the fairy circle. So it's very interesting that he's not looking where he's going. Yeah, well, maybe that is really a core thing with this doctor is that he's constantly leaping before he looks. Right. Right. So what does that say about the doctor? I feel like the doctor is always kind of taking things in and digesting them and figuring things out. But Shooty's doctor is always kind of just flying out of the TARDIS. Yeah. And it, it, I believe in the Devil's Court episode when they were first stepped on the road, the TARDIS made like a weird groaning noise. And even the doctor was like, that's weird. Mm-hmm. Like the talk, the TARDIS is acting very odd this season. So I just wanted to like preface that with this is there something to be said about the fact that it's kind of only half a tardis it, um, it's having trouble existing on its own maybe right because <laughs> he split it he hit it with that hammer and it, it became very, two very looney tunes yes <laughs> totally it really was it was like uh the what's that roger rabbit yeah right yeah so this episode again horror the first like i would say 15 20 minutes oh amazing like this i was like oh if the entire episode is in this pub, I am so here for it. Even so the woman being 73 yards away from her, if she goes towards her, she's still 73 yards, goes away, always following her. That is terrifying. Mm-hmm. And I love that. So there's these episodes called Doctor Who Unleashed, and it has everybody, Russell T. Davies and people talking about the episode. And you get kind of a behind the scenes of it. The reason why it's 73 yards is because Russell T. Davies wanted to know the distance of when you can't really make out somebody. To recognize them. And that was 73 yards. That's scary. (laughs) That's really scary. I love that little detail. And I'm like, that makes sense. Because sometimes you'll see somebody like across the way. And you're like, is that? Mm, I don't know. I can't really tell if that's them. Yeah. So us being not able to see who it is. And then finding out it's Ruby this whole time. That's why she couldn't tell Mm -hmm. that it was her. Yeah. That that was really. I mean, that's pretty brilliant. Right. And I love when we hear about these the thoughts they have behind the creation of certain aspects of the show and another thing that's interesting is that it's not just ruby that can see the woman everyone can Mm -hmm. see her they can approach her but when they talk to her she says something that scares them away and so the question is what is it that she says and so right there really isn't a specific thing yeah. Okay. Again, on Doctor Who Unleashed, I had to, I, I just needed to know, right? I was like, this is odd. Like, I'm fine with, by the end of this, we're probably going to get some answers, right? Mm-hmm. 
Russell D. Davies said, we will never know what older Ruby or whoever this woman is said to them. But essentially what he said was to the actors, think of the worst possible thing to be said to you. And that's what she says. Mm -hmm. So like, we're never going to know. But this is where I'm like on to you, Mr. Russell T. Davies. I don't believe him for a second. I mean, maybe we might not know, but like I'm taking everything he says with a grain of salt because Susan Twist, right? She shows up in this episode and Ruby kind of recognizes her and she has a conversation with her. So Russell T. Davies said, oh, we just like ran out of extras. So we just like hired this woman. I don't believe you now. Like after this episode with Ruby actually confirming like i've seen you before like where have i seen you is fishy mm -hmm. very fishy so i mean maybe another oh i'm, I'm getting off track here because i had another question for you but it almost feels like are we seeing multiple root like multiple lives of rubies well okay <laughs> right and the same people are showing up in it because it's her life and these characters will always yeah. be there so i think there's a conversation especially with this one where multiple timelines is a thing right and it seems like see this episode is like so like wah, all over the place that like even saying one thing can lead to like 10 different yeah. things and what's so wild about this episode though is that it does have a very straight through line yeah right it's literally just following her through the years and her figuring things out but because of the ending everything goes bonkers right right so, okay, I'll just, this is why I think in this season there's multiple timelines and that's an issue. Um, so when she's talking to uh, Susan Twist, very weird. She says something that's very odd. I had to go back and rewatch it because I was like, did she say that? When Ruby tells her, hey, can you go tell that woman, like, I'm sorry, I guess. And oh, I also ask her if she's seen the doctor. And she was like, oh, do you need a doctor? So I feel like she's playing stupid. But before she walks off, she says, make sure the both of you go and get warm. Who is she talking? Who's the both of you? Because she never prior to that, she never said anything about being with anybody else. It's just odd. I thought she was talking about the old woman. Maybe, but Ruby had told her, I don't know who she is. So mm. why would she couple her mm. with them? It's go and back and watch it. It's just strange. And isn't it weird that... She asks her if she needs a doctor, and just in the episode prior, she was a murdering ambulance. Yeah. <laughs> right? Do you need a doctor? Not from you. Not from you, lady. <laughs> so I've been trying to think about what is it that the mysterious woman says to these people. And I've been thinking that she shows them their greatest fear, or she shows them their death, because in my mind, the, at the end of the episode, Ruby is dying. And so that's what allows her to kind of see herself young again and be on the cliff. And so I think in that moment of death is what transports her. And when you talk to her, you see your own death. Maybe. I don't know. It's just, it's very strange. Like my, what I'm trying to figure out, and I guess we'll never know. Who knows by the end of this? Was that woman always Ruby? Or was it something else? And then when Ruby finally was able to confront that thing, she became her and was able to stop the events that led her to that point. Mm. You know, so it's like it could be either one. That, that is the fun thing about this, right? I feel like this episode with its like horror roots, political thriller and all of that, it leaves room for you to fill in the gaps that you want until it comes back. Yeah. Right. Until we get any definitive answer, it could be, I guess, whatever you want it to be. Yeah, I was in my head, the way that I looked at this episode was that, like I said, this particular Ruby, who is with the doctor when he disappears, unfortunately has to lead a very sad and lonely life. This is one of my, this is the thing I hate about Doctor Who, is like the companions coming to the realization that like, they can't be with the doctor anymore. They've had this fun and wonderful and dangerous and beautiful life with the doctor. Short amount of time for some of them, very long time for some of them. And the scene where she can't get back in the TARDIS, which is like also very intriguing. There's this whole thing of like the theory of like the doctor and the TARDIS being connected to each mm -hmm. other. And with the doctor taken out, does the TARDIS exist anymore? It just lies dormant. Who knows? Um, but her talking to the TARDIS, hoping that the doctor can hear her saying like, you know, if you come back, I'd really love that. But I guess bye. And it was so sad to see that. And those are the things that like, 
I dread with Doctor Who is the ending of the companion story because the companion is meant to be us. Like I could be a companion. Companions are usually like, you know, normal, ordinary people, a temp like Donna Noble. Like she's not special, even though everybody is special. Um, so having those endings and then them confronting it with it. And then this episode goes further and it just shows her life. Mm -hmm. And she's without the doctor. She's tried to date. She's tried to have a fulfilling life. And maybe she did, but she was undercover the whole time trying to take down this prime minister. So it's just really sad. I mean, how could you date and have a normal life when, first of all, that apparition scares your mom away? Yeah. And second of all, there's just always an old lady watching you. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you can't date. How and can you just, concentrate? She's just over there doing like the OA symbols, like yeah. hand movements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's like, oh, she's doing the Macarena. I'm like, what is she doing? I'm like, she's trying to send a message. She wasn't. Yeah, you better make sure you have like a small apartment that's not like seven hundred yards in your bathroom the whole time. Get out of here, lady. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> but I mean, by the end of it, she kind of befriends her. She's like, hey, good seeing you. Love you. Yeah, on top of like all the layers and genres that this is, the base of the episode is like what happens when everybody abandons you mm. in your life. Mm. Everybody abandons her. She has nobody left from her mother, her grandmother. Everybody has gone. The doctor to her dates. And her sitting at the cliff with the TARDIS all covered in moss and flowers and all these other things that people don't know why they put them there. And how she's like, I wasn't alone. Like, that's a good thing, right? I had this thing, this shadow following me the whole time. And even though everybody left me, that was there. So it was like a very bittersweet, sad thing for her to like realize and say out loud mm. when she's on her deathbed. Yeah. Oh, I don't like it. I'm just throwing out a theory that obviously is not true, but I just want to say it just because I think it's fun. What if old Ruby is the one that drops baby Ruby off at the church? There is a lot of theories of like, is, so the question is like, what is Ruby? Mm. Ruby is the girl that makes snow. Ruby is like the thing that the maestro doesn't know. The doctor's scanning doesn't even know. There's something weird about her. And I feel like maybe this whole episode was showcasing some of her power, mm. even though she doesn't realize it. Because when they first go there, she's like, I've only been to, you know, here twice. At the end of the episode, she says she's been there three times. And he's like, three times? What was the third time? And she's like, now? So even though that timeline got erased or everything in the events of the episode got erased, she still has some underlying memory mm -hmm. of what happened. So it's very odd. I'm still throwing it out there. Okay. I think Ruby is music. I think Ruby That's is too close to the maestro though. But the maestro think? isn't music. The maestro steals music. I think Ruby is song. Mm. I think that she is timeless. And I think that music can bring you back to a time when you were younger. I feel like that seems more likely, but I would, I, personally wouldn't say song just because it's too close to the maestro and it feels like everything we've gotten from the pantheon so far is like a particular sector right mm. i feel like it's too close to the maestro i would say more let's go on the time route like is there something where she is time or something or maybe she's christmas yeah she's the spirit of she's saint nick hello hello <laughs> she's the spirit of christmas saint, that saint nicholas <laughs> yeah it's actually a ruby yeah <laughs> I think we were getting little tiny breadcrumbs still. Of She's her. Easter Sunday. She, <laughs> no. Surprise. She's the bunny. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Side and eggs. No. All over time. So in this episode, what did you think about the whole scene that takes place in the pub? I loved it. Mm. Right. Because there's, it's so fun to have her in the pub with these people. And the danger is so far away and blurry, but we're still so scared of it, mm. right? And again, this is really when they play with a lot of camera angles of when they're kind of creating this tale of Mad Jack and everything that's going on. It's, it, it's frightening. And I think they do a lot of bait and switches here when she asks if she can pay with her phone and they don't, they're playing like she can. You're like, wait, what time is it? What universe is it? But it's actually just now. Right. So I think that they had a real a lot of fun in this scene. I liked it a lot. I, I thought it amped up the horror element a little bit. There was a part of me like towards the end where I was like, okay, you guys are like being mean too long. Like let's, <laughs> there's sarcasm can only get you so far. Mm. Like you have a visitor giving you more business inside from these 
three chumps that are <laughs> 65 quid a night five quid uh for a um coke coke yeah no i don't know no thank you that's a lot yeah <laughs> i also did like the little there was a part where she mentions fairy circles and the girl looks at the guy josh i think was his name and she's like he knows all about that and then he also says i'd be the first one to die which is the trope of the gay guy has yeah, to die. a minority yeah. usually dies first in a horror thing so we love a uh, queer emo in a small town. Hello. And they love him. <laughs> they always hang out at the pub together, yeah. apparently. The, um, what did you think about the political thriller aspect of this? So I liked it because it gave a purpose to Ruby having to live this life by herself. You know, and I think without that, it would have just been really sad. But it was this Ruby's mission. You know, she finally figures out that that's the point. And so, you know, was it a little clunky that when they're getting out of the TARDIS, the doctor just happens to mention this horrible prime minister? Yes, it definitely was an info drop. But, you know, we needed that to realize what was the point. Side note, I do think it's interesting that the doctor said, like, he's the worst prime minister in history. When Prime Minister Saxton, who turned out to be the master back in like past seasons, is a thing. So like doctor don't give it to him yet (laughs) well yeah i mean maybe there's a difference between you know the master and nuclear war (laughs) hey the master was world domination you know know. um it it is also interesting that at the restart at the end of the episode he starts mentioning the prime minister and then gets interrupted Mm -hmm. so there's that layer of like he mentioned it before they stepped on the thing so is he himself because he's a a a complex temporal event is he himself not able to piece together which timeline or what's happening because i find it very interesting that prior to breaking the fairy circle which lets mad jack out he knew that it was a thing right but she changed it right she stopped him from becoming but then he started saying it again but gets interrupted so it's very it's it's tiny so, so that's the question right is is this a complete new timeline or is this them reliving that timeline but with the change there's a, a conversation with kate stewart uh the unit director when they meet in a very like political thriller way where yes. they're like in an ca- open air cafe and they're talking about we got it. eyes on a yeah um and there's tons of agents everywhere but she did say something where Maybe your timeline is side by side to something else. Like she said something along those lines. And I was like, okay, so unit is aware of alternate timelines, the multiverse. (laughs) Honestly, I'm getting confused because I feel like, right. We did Loki season two Mm -hmm. and then we just did X-Men 97 and now we're in Doctor Who and they're all about timelines and fixed points. And I'm just, I'm trying (laughs) to keep it straight in my head. (laughs) It's not working. And we also did a three body problem, which dealed with like bending space and oh, dear Lord, <laughs> dear Lord. But so I do, I do find that interesting that there is this open conversation of alternate timelines and things changing. I mean, is there still a timeline out there where the doctor completely disappears mm. and unit and Ruby and everybody are left to, I don't know, protect earth without the doctor. What does that look like? Is it like Buffy, the vampire slayer that when one doctor disappears, another one appears? Well, there are no more Time Lords. He's the last. Last. But I mean, like, how, how, how the Doctor is kind of regenerated. Right. So does that mean that there will be another one popping up somewhere else? Or because well, Shuti de- is gone? Well, it depends if the Doctor is, like, actually erased. I mean, if uh-huh. he dies, he regenerates. Uh-huh. But if he's erased, he can't regenerate. So that's the question. <laughs> Right. See, like, oh. But no, this was like literally the first thing that I mentioned and we went on a total other thing because my next question was, why does he disappear? Right. I don't know. I have no idea. That's oh, yeah. that's where I'm thinking that this was all Ruby. I think this was very much Ruby because everything that he kind of seems to mention or like he started talking about the fairy circle and everything. It's like, you know, it's meant to keep things in. And then that happened. And it was almost like she because of what happens knows that like i'm the only one that can save this thing so he needs to go away and i need to play the long game to save this timeline from this prime minister Mm. i have no idea see that's where it gets all jumbly yeah i will say the political thriller stuff um heavy Mm -hmm. you know we got that the other assistant marty which i do feel like it was insinuated that he might have assaulted her in some way percent and this being an election year in the u.s i'm like I don't, I don't want, I, I know it's important, but I'm just like, nah, 
it was too familiar. And I feel like a lot of countries in the world are like, I can see this thing reflected in my real world. Um, didn't like it, but I understood the point. Yeah, I, I, this is really completely out of left field, but I just watched a short 60 minute segment um, about a new play by Moises Kaufman that's based on a photo album found of a soldier, a Nazi at uh, Auschwitz, right? And how these Nazis, they had festivals, they sang. I mean, while they were killing millions of, of people, but they lived a life right. that they were happy with. And so they, um, in this interview, spoke to a woman who had survived and she never saw the rest of her family again. And one of the things she said, and I'm paraphrasing, is she said something like, humans are the most dangerous animal and all they need is permission to be horrible and they'll take it. Right. And so we're seeing that mm -hmm. in our lives here and also in this episode of that this horrendous, horrific person can come to power because the people have given him permission to. Right. And so he's not only dangerous because of nuclear weapons and wanting to just use one because he can. But he's also a horrible person to the people around him constantly, including this young woman. Yeah. So it, it's it's terrible. Yeah. You know, I'm a little confused on, you know, he did this whole speech, I think, in the the interview or the pre-taping of it where he talks about he wants to secure the borders and all of that stuff we, we've heard. Right. It's very xenophobic. It's very like othering. Um, and it's like what. I don't think like I wish this episode was 10 more minutes longer, mm. um, especially for this political part, because while I found it engaging. I wanted a little more because it seemed like his switch into being awful. He was always awful, but like I wanted a little more because him just saying I wanted nukes. It's like for what? Like I know to use them, but like I, I personally wanted like more of like, what is his plan here? Um, I'm glad he didn't get to it or do it, but that's my only critique with this episode. It's like 45 minutes was a little short personally for like how layered this episode was. Sometimes it's just about power. Yeah. And, you know, just being a mad person. He's mad Jack, right? Yeah. Also, I think the, another big question we have here is, what was with the grass on the pitch? Don't go on the grass. Don't touch the grass. I'm, I, you know, any of our um, UK <laughs> listeners, like, is that like a respect thing? Maybe. I, I don't know. I have no idea. No, they, were, they, they had a gun on her because she was on the grass. <laughs> I did like how she got rid of the prime minister. She yeah. was like, Oh, like this is like what I'm supposed to do. So her counting yeah. and like making sure it lined right up with him. Another sort of info dumpy thing again was right before she does that, right before she makes him speak to the woman, the kind of campaign head campaign person's like, oh, look at that. He says hi to everyone, even though he's, you know, such a big guy now. It's like, oh, okay. So then he'll definitely say hi to the woman because she's on stage with him. But like, if a random old lady appeared next to me, I'd just be like, whoa, hi. <laughs> You know, I don't <laughs> yeah. think we needed them to be like, he talks to everyone. Well, I also think, though, as part of the perception of like these awful people mm -hmm. being like seeming like they're good people mm -hmm. around everybody, but like they're truly awful. To make the switch. Right. That's how I got that. But you bringing that up, I'm like, oh, OK, I could see how that yeah. relates to it. Um, I want to say I need to know Ruby's skincare routine. Because even though I loved, I loved the way this whole episode was shot, but especially her going through the years with the card and then her drinking that glass of wine, looking out at her perpetual shadow, um, she looked amazing. Like she just put glasses on, had a wig and she's like, I'm 40. They said, <laughs> as you get older, the only thing that changes is that your hair gets bigger and you drink wine. Right. Regularly. Absolutely. I mean. <laughs> Which yes. is very true. true. That is correct. <laughs> so true. I just, yeah, I, I thought she, she looked great. I did want to say, though, that I loved that the way that we knew time was passing was that every time she was looking out the window at the woman, there was a different birthday card. Yeah, that's on what the I just said, but fine. <laughs> yeah. No, it was, a, again, that's like, I love like that silent storytelling. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, more time has passed by. And then when it said 40 years, I was like, girl. Like, damn. I think it would have been great if she was 73 years old when she, <sighs> whatever is happening in that hospital lights off or whatever. I am kind of curious, though, like why they didn't do aging makeup on her. Mm -hmm. There is an episode that is in um, Matt Smith's era with Amy Pond, and it's called The Girl Who Waits. Um, watch that episode. I, I watch every episode. I'm going to stop saying this, but. I'm actually going to show you this episode. He's Sorry. pointing at me. He's I'm pointing at me. Pointing very vigorously. 
Um, I'm going to show you this episode because it's fantastic and it harkens to this a lot. But Amy ages, right? And they put this makeup on her and like, I'm like, dang, like the years really went on you. Mm. So it was, it was an interesting choice to like just give her glasses a wig and Well, I mean, wine. she was only like 43. And? Excuse me. I'm going to be 39 next week. Oh, okay. I don't look that bad do roll I? back the tapes of our first episode oh Let's my god that. baby smooth skin yeah. <laughs> although i do have a lot of gray chest hair showing right now silver silver we call it silver <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah but i think that uh yeah we could have maybe done with a little more makeup but you know they were like it's our first episode don't mm. put too much makeup on it what did you think about all the um stuff with her mother and her grandmother i love seeing them again yeah but it uh, like it's so scary to think about what does this woman say to them that would make them disown their pride and joy, the thing they love most in the world. I think there's an interesting thing to think about with that. The way you put that is that we all act that way. We all have this perception that somebody could take away the closest people to us from how somebody perceives us or them telling them something. You know what I mean? Mm. Like that feeling of like, this could always go away with somebody just saying something about me, mm. even if it's bad or not. But like, I don't know. That's just, that's the feeling I got with it. And like the scene with her running after her mom in the taxi, one, Arla looking like a boss in that taxi when it was like driving by her. She was like, she was like, <laughs> middle finger. <laughs> she might up. as well just done that. Yeah. Um, devastating. And for this to be her first time, like filming for Doctor Who, Oh, tears. Yeah. So sad. Her sitting outside of the house after she's locked out. That was messed up. Knowing and oh, just like hearing the most worst possible things that could be said to you. It's like, yeah, no wonder your mom didn't want you. It's like, what is wrong with you? You know, we have to. So, OK, so old mystery Ruby, right, has to say the worst thing to a person because they cannot disrupt this timeline they can't take her off the path exactly. she's going on yeah and so she needs to be with her ruby needs to be with ruby until she's on the field on the pitch with that prime minister to make him run away right so she needs to drive everyone away from her because right. she cannot stop it otherwise it's nuclear war which is insane it's so sad yeah now another question i have is when old ruby is laying in that bed in the hospital and the figure is coming closer and closer. Why is it that we're only seeing the back of the figure? I couldn't tell if it was the back or she just had a hair in front of her. Oh, she's doing grudge? She's, yeah. she's doing the ring? Maybe, you know, so the actor that plays that woman is a different woman that plays older Ruby. And I feel like they did that production-wise to throw off the scent mm. of like, this could be Ruby. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, so maybe we didn't fully see her face. Because they didn't want to be like, that wasn't Ruby, even though it's supposed to imply it is Ruby. And maybe because she's always so far away from her, she doesn't know what her face looks like. Well, I mean, even UNIT with their advanced technology, they couldn't even get a picture of her. So maybe it's just the whole thing. In this episode, they do bring up the perception filter again. Um, it's been gone for a while. So the perception filter can literally just make you perceive anything. Mm -hmm. And so I'm partly curious of like, you know, Ruby gets told that there's the whole circle thing and stuff. And maybe because the TARDIS landing near it or on it, the, the older woman in the pub talked about like the stilted man and the, the veil between like the sea and the land. And with the TARDIS being right there, was the whole perception of everything skewed or was it made to look like something else? Or I don't know. Yeah. Like, it's just or very, is it, is it that it landed between two realities and, mm. and it just split from yeah. there. The, the whole scene in the hospital, one Ruby being like, yeah, we had Alexa with me growing up. I know. Thank you, nurse lady. Yeah. It's like that <laughs> meme of like when it's like the child walking the old lady and she's like, back in my day, we had compact discs. And yeah. they're like, OK, grandma. Yeah. Like, that's what it felt like. <laughs> yeah. That whole scene was terrifying. Yeah. Oh, I loved it with the it going to her, then going to old her, then like creepy her and the lights going in and out. Production. Yeah. And apparently Ghost Ruby or whatever, Harry Ruby also knew to do lights on, lights off or whatever because she kept shutting them off. She's like, lights, lights, lights. <laughs> yeah. It was Ellie Goulding. Yeah. It was Ellie Goulding. And then, lights. you know, her finally being able to, the scene with just her hands 
and you realizing that it's her beautifully shot and her being able to finally tell Ruby, don't step, don't step. Mm -hmm. And so it warned the doctor not to step, which is really interesting that it broke the time loop, I'm assuming, because this had to have happened how many times or in different timelines for her to finally break through and tell this Ruby, don't step to prevent all of the stuff from happening. It's very, it's timey-wimey. It's yeah. confusing. I'm really, really, really. Yeah. So it, you know, it really does. Anticipating it to show at the end. Sorry. Of the season. Sorry. <laughs> I think it really is separate timelines. It mm-hmm. has to be because by her showing up and getting him to not step on it, he can't even remember the name of the prime minister anymore. Yeah. So it's totally different because then what's the point, you know, of her, if she can't, survive anymore then she doesn't stop the prime minister from becoming prime minister so it has to be a separate timeline you're thinking like a doctor who viewer the more you question it sometimes the more it's like wait am i in the tardis there yeah it's interesting there's a whole thing of paradoxes and time loops and everything and then there's the supernatural element you know i i don't know i mean this episode for me 10 out of 10 i really 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 enjoyed it do you have any final thoughts i wrap it up no i was just gonna say i like this much better than the last episode I actually, this was better than Boom. Oh, man. Yeah, this was like, you know, again, I'm always here for a strong, you know, female lead. So that was exciting. And I just thought it brought so many elements. I, this is my type of horror. Hmm. I like creepy psychological. horror, psychological horror. I don't like murdering people. I don't like torturing people. This is right in my wheelhouse. So two thumbs up, two thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, I, final thoughts, great. Really enjoyed it. I'm very excited to see where this goes. It is one of those episodes where the answers will come when they come. Maybe sometimes they don't, but sometimes that's a good thing. Like the ambiguity, we've had this whole conversation of like, literally we were here for like, what, 30 minutes talking about what this could mean. And it could mean any one of those things. Yeah. I want to sit down and write the letters out of Ruby Sunday and see if it's like a mix An up. Anagram. Yeah. <laughs> if, it, if it really spells something else. Oh, man. Well, so let us know what you thought. You know, add us anywhere. ABO nipples at gmail.com. Our mailbox is always open. Um, so yeah, till next week, till episode five. Here we go. Ooh, dot and bubble. Social media commentary. Oh my gosh, not social media. You know what's really funny is that that episode seems like it's Ruby and Dr. Light. Right. So it's like we got a very heavy doctor episode. We got a companion episode. And now they're just going to be like on a screen. I'm already getting feelings of it's the circle meets that one Black Mirror episode with mm. Bryce Dallas Howard. Oh, nosedive. Yeah. Very good. I guess we'll see what happens. Oh my God. See you next week. Bye. Bye.